Ray Hope family, friends, guests, thank you so much for taking time to be a part of our broadcast this morning. We want to let you know how important you are and how much we love you and care for you. If you're at home or you're on vacation or you're in your office or wherever you're at, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking time to be a part of this. We know this morning's uh, message will encourage you, inspire you, so I encourage you to take out your notebooks, take out your phones, take notes, let God speak to you. We love you guys, and we can't wait to see you. Good morning, church. Can you give Jesus Christ a hand clap of praise this morning? Thank you for joining us. If you're able to, stand to your feet and let's worship the Lord. As we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer.
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me There is another in the fire
that's where you'll be Count the joy, come every bed I know that's where you'll be God, no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be, here in your love, here in your love, no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be. i
sing that. Lift your voices. No place. No. And to feel your presence, Lord. No place. To feel the fire. Stirring our soul.
stand with me this morning. So good to see you. We're glad that you are here. If you're watching online, we really appreciate you being with us in this service. How many of you feel like we've already had church? I'll tell you what, I'm already psyched up, aren't you? I got enough for uh, this morning and tonight, since we're not going to meet tonight. So uh, I needed a double portion. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that you love us, you care for us. Lord, speak to our hearts. Let us be receptive to the word of God today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbors. I'm glad you're here this morning. I want to speak to you this morning about being supernatural or superficial. We live in a very, very superficial world. It's all about image, isn't it? Well, today's October the 31st, and uh, there'll, there'll be a lot of people who are going to dress up like they're not. And uh, my, uh, my grandkids, uh, we, we got to be with one of them last night. And so Riley, three, she dressed up like Anna of Frozen, the princess. And then Hartley is six months old, and she was a little reindeer. Now, let me tell you, Ian's picture's not up there, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, Aaron and Natalie wanted to stick with the Frozen, you know, theme. So Riley was going to be Anna of Frozen, and Ian was going to be Olaf, the little snowman. So they bought him the Olaf costume, and they dressed him up like the little snowman. But when he looked at himself in the mirror, it scared him so much, he would not put it back on again. So uh, he went as the cookie monster. So sometimes, you know, we appear to be what we're not, and, and sometimes people can scare us because they are fake. And I want to address that this morning, and let me just begin with this. How many of you would stay with me till the end, and how many of you will love me when I finish? Okay, about half of you will do that. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter, I mean James chapter 1, then we'll go to Matthew chapter 23, and in these two passages, I want to address something that I think is very pivotal, not only for us today in our church, but churches throughout the world. You see, we are going to address what James is saying this morning, beginning at uh, verse 22, chapter 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and does, and is not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looked like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, who perseveres and continues in it, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So like Ian looking in the mirror, scaring himself, and then forgets that, you know, that's really not him. We don't want to look in the mirror and forget who we really are. So here's the question. Are you the one in the mirror, or is that just an image of who you are? And the answer is, it's an image of who you are, but we want who you seem to be to be who you really are. Does that make sense? So we we don't want to see the mirror version of you. I want to see the real you. You don't want to see the mirror image of me. You want to see the real me. Not just the version you see on Sunday morning, but the version you see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now, this is important because Christianity's gotten a bad rap by a few rotten apples. Don't shout me down. Am I authentic? Am I superficial? Am I putting on the mask? Am I the person who I say I'm in, I'm really am? Am I pretending to be something I'm not? And people can tend to live a very superficial life. Now, let me give you a couple of definitions here, and let me preface it by saying this. We don't need a Photoshop version of Christianity. I mean, there's the good and the bad and the ugly of it. I mean, this is real life. People go through tragedy and trauma, and they go through very difficult things, and you have and I have, and we'll continue to do that until Jesus comes along, because in this world we shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, he's overcome the world. Now, in saying that, superficial means shallow, on the surface, lacking depth, appearing to be true or real until it is examined more closely. Now, the Greek word for this is the word that we know as hypocrite. It's the Greek word hypocrites. It means an actor or a pretender. 
Now, I've given you uh, that definition. I want to give you another one, supernatural. It's beyond the natural, beyond what it is seen. And let me add to that for today's uh, session. It means profound, deep, earnest, and significant. So we don't want to be superficial. How many of you know we want to be supernatural? Who we are, what we do, we want it to be authentic. We want it to be real. Eric uh, Hulstrand from North Dakota, he's a pastor, and I read this many years ago. And he gave an account in his church. So they're having church. They're gathering, getting ready for worship. And one of the older congregants by the name of Mary, for some reason, she passed out. She had a medical issue. But when she passed out, she fell over backward and banged her head on the edge of the pew, and it was very severe. So they called the ambulance. Those pictures in your mind, the red lights are flashing. The sirens are blaring. It pulls up to the church. But they get Mary, the elderly woman, strapped to the stretcher. They're wondering if she's going to survive. And while she's on the stretcher, Mary regains consciousness and she opens up her eyes. Now her daughter is with her that Sunday morning. And she asks for her daughter to come close to her mouth and she's whispering in her ear. And most people think that maybe Mary is telling her goodbye, last words. We, we, we don't know what she's going to say. But this is what Mary whispered to her daughter. My ties are in my purse. Please be sure you get it to them when they take up the offering. How many of you know Mary was not superficial? She was supernatural. I mean, she had some depth about, depth about her life. So we don't want to be those just surface believers. We, we want to be authentic. We want to be real. We want this to be who we are in, not in the mirror, but in everyday life. So Jesus addresses this with a group of people. It's in Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to get at verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, therefore whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men, they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments, they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, but you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on this earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Now, obviously, he's talking about spirituality. We all have fathers, and we can call them father, dad, pop, or whatever. But how many of you get the point what Jesus is saying? He is saying there are characteristics of Christian leaders and even Christians that can be very superficial. And we don't want to be superficial, we want to be supernatural. And let's address this. There are eight characteristics that Jesus points out in these passages, and here's number one. They were known more for what they were against than what they were for. The world has a view of the Christianity version sometimes, and the Christian, you guys are against everything. The only thing we can do is just go eat, and eat, and eat some more. But <laughs> the thing about it is it, it appears that we're against everything. How many of you know we're for things? We don't want to be known for what we're against. We want to be known for what we're for. We're for your family. We're for your marriage. We're for your children. We're for your business. We for, we're for your success in the confines of the Word of God. And only through that can we have true success, not just success on this earth, but success beyond this, here, now, and in the air, right? So we are for your development, for your success in every way. And that's what we should proclaim. Now, caveat is there are some things that we cannot compromise on. There are some things we cannot back up on. Can I hear an Amen. We need to stand the ground of the firm foundation of Christian values today because they're waning in our culture and we need to be firm there. But we are for the people of God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So God is for the world, but the world must come his way and it's their choice. So we don't want to be known for what we are just against. And You've known that person, they walk in the room and 
the light goes out and the glass is always half full and you like to avoid them and it's negative Nelly and you know it's just everything is bad 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 and everybody's going to go to hell in a handbasket and there's no redemption for anybody how many of you know that's not the people we should be we should be known for what we're for, not just what we're against. Look at verse 4 there. They bind heavy burdens on people and not willing to lift it themselves. And let me just add this. And sometimes in the private, they don't live what they're saying. Which brings us to number two. They care more about their own traditions and what people think as opposed to what God thinks. Now, everybody has traditions. I don't care who you are, you have traditions. Every church has traditions. And we have traditions here. Traditions are not bad unless they supersede the Word of God. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. My wife, Carrie, is great with traditions. I'm not so much so, but she is. How many of you know there's Christmas traditions, there's uh, Thanksgiving traditions, there's uh, Halloween traditions maybe that you have. You have traditions for birthdays, anniversaries, could be anything. When, when our boys were growing up, Carrie was very good every, every Christmas Eve. She, she read them the Christmas story. And she did that year after year after year after year. Every Christmas Eve, she usually had, you know, some new pajamas the boys would have, and they would go to bed in those. Every Christmas Eve, we would have milk and cookies on the table. And I'll tell you who had to eat them. <laughs> it was a burden. But I persevered through it. I mean, Kara was great with Christmas traditions and birthday traditions. I mean, she just did that so well. And, and nothing wrong with tradition, but it can't supersede the Word of God. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. We don't want our traditions to take the place of the Word of God. Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 5 through 8, when the Pharisees, the scribes, ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, let me say this. Uh, you should wash your hands. But you don't have to wash your hands to get to heaven. You may get there earlier, but you, you don't have to wash your hands to get to heaven. But, but this is the deal. They're, they're going through, they're, they're picking up food, and they're eating it. And the scribes of the Pharisees say, they're not doing the traditions of, of our fathers. Verse 6, he answered, said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? These people, they're... They, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Let me stop there. So what they're doing, they're teaching their traditions as doctrine. Boy, listen closely. I'm, I'm giving you the $64,000 version here today. Nothing wrong with tradition, but don't teach it as doctrine. Because some people have tradition, it's fine, it's good, don't teach it as doctrine because it's not doctrine. You may celebrate Christmas different than me, me than you, Thanksgiving, whatever. It's your tradition, but it's not doctrine. They taught tradition as doctrine, and Jesus upbraided them for that. And he says, laying aside the commandment of God, you hold on to the tradition of men. You've elevated the tradition, you've made it doctrine, and that is not the word of God. And so we have to be careful for that. Amen. So question, do we please men or God? And the answer should be, we should be pleasing God over men. Matthew 23, 5. But they all do their works to be seen of men. So this is not the show. This is not why we're doing this. Number three, superficial is going through the motions without the right motives and motivation. It's good to be baptized, but you should be baptized for the right reason. It's good to pray. Pray for the right reason. It's good to give. Give for the right reason. Motives are important. And that's what he's saying. So are we doing the right things for the right reason? 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul addresses this young minister and he gives them the attributes of people in the last days. And he says at the end, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Now, this is what he's saying. They're religious. They have a form, but really they don't have the power of God. They don't have the strength of God. They're just going through motions. And let me tell you, we don't need to go through motions. How many of you know we need the real deal? We need the power of God. The fourth thing is they said one thing and did another thing. They said one thing and did another thing. 
Verse 3, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. If I ask you to be faithful, am I faithful? If I ask you to pray, do I pray? If I ask you to give, do I give? If I tell you you ought to be nice to your spouse, am I nice to my spouse? How many of you know, whatever I tell you to do, I should be doing. And if I'm not doing that, I'm a hypocrite. I'm like the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, whatever I ask you to do, I should be willing to do. Always the, the first uh, a month of, of January, we've been doing this for years and years and years, we proclaim a fast. How many of you know that is very biblical? Now, whether you fast or you don't fast, that's between you and God. But if I stand up here and ask you to fast, how many of you know I should be fasting? Because this is the pharisaical spirit. I'm going to ask you to do something that I'm not doing. And he upbraids them for that. So I'm not going to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Can I hear an amen? Here's the fifth thing. They were into religious ceremony instead of sincere worship. You know, we can go through the motions. I can raise my hands. I can jump up and down. I can say amen. I can sing. But you know what? It, it's not just the motions. It should be sincere worship. It, it comes from my heart. Now, there are three things in this passage Jesus really addressed. Let me give those to you. They make broad their phylacteries. Now, if you don't know what that is, they either took cloth or leather, and they would wind it around their arms and even around their head. Sometimes they would put a box on, on their forehead. In that box, it would uh, uh, maybe contain Scripture. Now, nothing wrong with that. I mean, that was a custom. That's what they did. But if you wanted to be seen, guess what you did? You just made your uh, strips wider. You made the bands larger. So it's not that I'm not doing that. I want you to notice what I'm doing. So he said that's what they did. The second thing, they enlarged the borders of their garments. Now, when the rabbis and the priests, they were out in public, they had a robe or a prayer shawl on, and there was a border around that garment. And they had tassels hanging off the robes and, and the prayer shawls. Now, the, the name of that in Hebrew is to zit. zit it, it's funny, isn't it? It's like you got a lot of zits right there. But it is an eight-stranded, woven, knotted-together tassel, and it would go around their garments. And what it represented, because of the numbers adding together, it was 613, which represented the 613 commandments of God under the Mosaic Law. Do you remember when the woman who was uh, dying from the issue of blood, and she pressed through the crowd? And she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. You know, in, in their culture, you know what she was doing? She was reaching out in faith to touch the word. But let me tell you what she was doing. She was touching the word word. She, she was touching the literal word that was carrying the word around the fringes of his garment. How many you know Jesus is the word? So she got a double portion. What she thought she was getting is just the fringe of the word. But she got the word word. And she was made whole. And Jesus acknowledged her. And so that fringe and that border around the garment, so if you wanted to be noticed more, what did you do? You made the border of your garment larger, so when you sashayed into the synagogue, or you went to the streets, hey, look at me, I got the large border. Nobody ever does that, do they? What are they doing? They're attracting attention to themselves. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. When you pray, now this is Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Say that with me. Hypocrites. Now let's say it and don't be hypocrite here. Okay. Uh, hypocrites. So don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the streets, uh, corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So what does he say? Don't pray like them. The reason they're praying the way they pray is they're praying to be seen. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying on the street. The other day, I prayed in the grocery store. Prices are so high. No, that's not what I prayed. <laughs> I, I prayed in the grocery store. There was a lady there that I knew, and uh, she was going through some medical treatment. 
And she stopped, and she, she knew who I was, and she said, Pastor Mike, she said, uh, I don't know if you know, but I, I have this condition. And, and I said, I'm so sorry. She said, would you pray for me? Now, have you ever done this? Someone said, pray for me, and you left, and you forgot to pray for them. So sometimes I said, well, let's just pray right now. And, and the older I get, the more I'm saying, let's pray now. But uh, she said, would you pray for me? And I said, would you care if I pray with you right now? So we're in the grocery store. We have our carts. And I stop. I lay hands on her, and I pray for her right there. And I didn't do that to be seen of anyone. Uh, people are going by with carts, and we're praying in the aisle of the grocery store. So there's nothing wrong with that. But, but I'm not doing it so everybody in the grocery store can see me praying. That's not the motive here. So he says they love to pray. Verse 16, uh, when over, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the what? Hypocrites. He does that again. He, he calls them out with a sad countenance, for they disfigured their face that they may appear to men to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have the reward. What's the reward? The praise of men, because it's not going to be in heaven. So they're just doing it to have the praise of men. Notice me, look at me. So l listen, this is not sincere worship. This is a show. God forbid that we get into the mode in our church that this is a show. This is not a show. We should have sincere worship. And so we don't want to be in the culture of look at me, this is the show. We need to constantly have sincere worship. We need to have a heart like that. We don't want to walk around and say, are you noticing me? Are you noticing me? Here's the sixth thing. They appear to be one thing on the outside, but there's something very different on the inside. I heard this the other day. There was a guy who was looking for a job and there was a notice that the zoo was looking for uh, people for certain jobs. And it wasn't for very long. It was just for a few days, but they were paying a lot of money. And he thought, well, I re really need a long-term job, but I don't have a job. and They're paying a lot of money. I'll go apply. So he goes to the, to the zoo, and he applies. And this is what they said. Hey, hey uh, we, we've got a lot of school field trips coming through here, and um, we, we don't have a gorilla. So would you be willing for the next few days to put on this gorilla suit? We'll put you in the gorilla habitat. Just don't get too close to the glass and, and act like a gorilla. You can swing, you can eat bananas, whatever you want to do. So he said, sure, if you're going to pay me that much money, I'll, I'll be the gorilla. So he dons the gorilla suit. He's back in the habitat. And I mean, day after day after day, he's acting like a gorilla. I mean, I think he ate too many bananas, but... Anyway, so, so one day, uh, that last day, he's swinging, and, and he gets too rambunctious, and he swings over to the lion habitat. And he lands next to a lion, and he begins to scream, help me, help me, help me. And the lion says, be quiet, buddy. We're both going to lose our job. <laughs> How you know everything doesn't appear the way it is? Because sometimes you think it's this, but it's that, and that should not be happening in the church. Now listen, Matthew 23 again. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, and the outside, but that the outside of them may be, the inside may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear to be beautiful outwardly, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you should also, uh, also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So what is he saying? You look one way on the outside, you're completely different on the inside. If I go to work, and I say I'm a Christian, I go to church, and I use bad language, tell bad jokes, whatever. How many of you know I'm very superficial? Whatever I'm going to be here, I should be out there. How I many you know this is a checkup from the neck up? Now, none of us are perfect. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. Uh, I've told this story many times. Brother Ben Robertson, who used to preach here, he's all gone on to be with the Lord now. But he told me one day when he was preaching here, he went to Duncan, and he met someone there, and they said, well, you're not from here? He said, no, I'm from eastern Oklahoma. And they said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm here preaching at Rev Hope Church. And they said, you know there's some hypocrites in that church. 
And I love Brother Ben. He never, he never missed a beat. He said, oh, I'm sure there are. He said, Jesus had 12. Not all, all of them were sincere. How many of you know Jesus had 12 and Judas was not sincere? It's hard to get very many people together and everybody be completely sincere. If Jesus couldn't do it or wouldn't do it or didn't do it, how many of you know, chances are you and I are going to have a few people who are not very sincere. But don't be one of them. Be who you say you are. So they claim to be one thing on the outside. There's something completely different going on with them on the inside. He says, you, you are trying to clean the outside, but you're doing nothing about the inside. So we have to be careful of that. Number seven, they sought position and titles. Look with me back to Matthew 23, and there's nothing wrong with position and titles, but here's the problem. Many times they're misconstrued, they're misused, and they're also deceptive. I can tell you I'm a welder, but I can't weld. I can tell you I'm a teacher, but I can't teach. I can tell you I'm a singer, and I can't sing. I can tell you I'm a leader, but I can't lead. When Carrie and I were getting ready to get married in June, I was uh, trying to finish up college and so we were getting married, and I knew I needed a job for about three months in the summer. So I went down here to the place where they make agricultural equipment, and I applied for the job. And I said, I'll sweep the floor, whatever. I need a job for about three months. And this is what they asked me. They said, can you weld? <laughs> well, my dad taught me how to weld ever since I was a kid, and I could weld. I said, I can weld, but I'm not a welder. I mean, how do you know there's a difference between somebody who can weld and a welder? And so I said, I can weld, but I'm not a welder. So they said, okay, would you go down there and help this guy? He's making hog scales. And I said, okay, I will go back, uh, be his helper. So after two weeks, I was the head hog scale maker. <laughs> I don't know how many of are still together today, but anyway. So for about three months, all I did was weld up and assemble hog scales. So it's one thing to say I'm a welder, but I can't weld, or I'm a teacher, I can't teach, I'm a leader, I can't lead, or whatever it is, we need to be who we say we are. And that's very, very important. Matthew chapter 23, verse 6 and 7, they love the best seats, they love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi. Well, what are they doing? Back to this. They're superficial. They're not supernatural. Folks, we need to be supernatural people. We need to believe in the power of God, the miraculous power of God, the, the things that God can do that we cannot do. And we need to represent ourselves truthful to the world around us. So let's not be a deceptive person. Here's the eighth and the last. They were not accepting of other people. And I want you to say that very loudly with me. They were not accepting of other people. Listen, we need to be accepting of people. We may not like their sin, but we have to be accepting to them. Do you know why the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees didn't like Jesus? Two reasons. Number one, he revealed who they really were, and he loved people that they hated. Let me say that again. He revealed to people who they really were, and he loved people who they hated. You see, the Bible says that Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners. And they hated publicans and sinners. But Jesus saved a lot of publicans and sinners. You say, well, who was that? How about Levi sitting at the receipt of custom? Why did they hate them? Because they collected taxes for the Romans. That's why they hated him. But Jesus went by that publican and said follow me and guess what happened he left and he is the one who wrote the first gospel in your bible by the name of matthew remember the guy up the tree zacchaeus climbed up the tree to see jesus do you know the crowd was shocked when jesus said today i'm coming to your house why would this holy man why would this rabbi go to a roman tax collector's house because he loved him and he was willing to change him if Zacchaeus is willing to receive Jesus. And we know he was. 
How about the Samaritan woman at the well? I mean, she's the one who even was surprised that Jesus was even there. If you remember, Jesus told his disciples, I need to go through Samaria. And he went there just for her. No other, no other reason we're given in that account. And this is what she said. How is it that you, being a man and a Jew, would talk to me, a woman and a Samaritan? And he said, woman, if you knew who I was, if you knew who I was, and guess what? He told her who he was. It's the first time in your Bible he said, I am the Messiah to a woman who had been married over and over and over again. Who was a Samaritan? Why did he do that? He loved her, and he wanted her life to change. Or we could say, what about the woman caught in the act of adultery? In some way, Jesus rescued her, didn't he? But I'll guarantee you he did not condone her sin but he loved the person. But they were willing to kill that person, but he gave her grace. Now let me tell you, don't, don't abuse the grace of God. He said, go and sin no more. So we're not condoning sin, but how many of you know we need to sometimes look past the sin and see the person without condoning the sin? Because everybody comes the same way. I don't care who you are today, you came as a sinner. Well, your sin was, was worse than mine. Well, let me tell you, either one of them will keep us out of heaven. I don't care how bad your sin is. The other day, Matthew sent me a little cartoon. And the cartoon was this, and I, I've addressed this before, so it's not any revelation. But this guy is at the entrance of heaven. And I don't know if it was St. Peter or whoever it was, but the gates were behind him, and there was a little, little kiosk there. And this guy standing there, and Peter says, well, we were going to let you in, but there was that incident when you were working cattle. So that's why my son sent it to me. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story for those of you that haven't heard it. So this is what my son said one time. He said, all of our lives, both the boys said, we have never heard our dad say bad words but one time. Y'all are so holy. I'm confessing here. So we had this cow that was demon-possessed, I think. So we're trying to get it up, and I'd worked and worked trying to get this cow up, couldn't get it up. Finally, one day we got it up, got it in the lot. One of the gates was open on the other end, and it went right in right out. And I don't know what I said. I might have said, damn, hell, or something. I don't know what it was. But both the boys looked at me like, I can't believe Dad said that. So if you're doing better than that, let me applaud you, but I'm just telling you, it's kind of become a little joke in our family. But you know what? You, you, you got to realize people are flawed. And if you're here today and say, well, you know, I, I'm not a great Christian and I don't know much about the Bible, thank you for being here today. That's how the rest of us got here. Because we're flawed people trying to find the mercy and the grace of God. Now, Obviously, we don't want to continue in sin, and as Jesus finds you, he don't want to keep you there. He wants to take you beyond that, but we have to be willing to say everybody in our church doesn't have to look like me. So am I going to accept those who come? And that's exactly why they hated Jesus, because he accepted people they weren't willing to accept. Mary Magdalene, goodness gracious, she's got devils in her and is a prostitute. And she's the first one at the tomb when the stone is rolled away. Because Jesus is accepting people that maybe we sometimes don't think we should accept. The Roman centurion that Jesus heals his servant. And this guy is a Roman occupying the land of Palestine. Or the story of the good Samaritan and Jesus makes the, the Samaritan the hero. He makes the Samaritan the hero and they hated Samaritans. How many of you know he did that on purpose? Because he wanted to accept people that that religious group wouldn't accept. So what am I saying? Do not have the spirit of a Pharisee. And our church shouldn't either. You say, do we have that? I don't think so, but let's not get it. Because we want to accept people. We don't condone their sin, but we have to accept they have a heart and a soul that needs Jesus Christ. 
And we need to reach out to them. Can I hear an amen? I can't afford to be superficial. I need to be supernatural. I need to be real. I can't always put on the mask, be something that I'm not. Recently, I heard a guy tell the story of their vacation. and He, he said, we, we went to the Gulf. We, we got a condo, our family, and it's a group of condos. And so we're get, getting ready to go to the beach. We're going to the ocean. And so we have our bathing suits on, and, and we, we have all the things that we're going to have at the beach. And so we go to the back of the condo, and in this group of condos, there, there's a swimming pool in the back. And he said, my three-year-old daughter, I picture her in her little bathing suit and flip-flops, maybe her water wings. And, and he said, we walked by the swimming pool, and she jumped in. He said, honey, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm going to the ocean. Well, she'd never been to the ocean. And he said, honey, this is not the ocean. This is a pool. Get out. We're going to go to the ocean. You see, sometimes in our life, we're settling for the pool. And God has a big ocean. We're in the kiddie pool. We're superficial. And we could go deeper and wider. And as Paul said, you can't fathom how high and deep and broad and wide this is. This kingdom is deep and wide. That'd make a good song, wouldn't it? Uh, This is a big kingdom. This is a deep kingdom. This is not a superficial kingdom. This is beyond our capacity, but yet we we dive into it, not in the kiddie pool, but in the ocean, as far as you can see, the vastness of what God has for all of us. But sometimes we're willing to be immature and getting in the pool and think this is all God has. That's superficial. Superficial. I believe that God is going to do things that we haven't even imagined yet. We haven't even thought of yet. A young lady was in my office this week. As a matter of fact, she's here this morning. And I had about 30, 45 minute hour visit with her. And she came in with such excitement and enthusiasm and faith. And listen, when she, when she left my office, I was excited because... She saw all the things that God can do. She said, God can do so much more. We, we've just begun. That's what she told me. And I said, listen, sister, I'm with you on that. So today, you're here, and I'm challenging you. Don't be superficial. Now, maybe that's the way we feel like we start, but how many of you know we just need to keep growing and growing and growing, accepting people, receiving people? Listen, I believe, and I hope you believe with me, We've just begun. There are people who need the Lord. They don't need religion. They need Jesus. And some people are just repeating the same shallow things one year and another year and another year and another year. They stay in the pool when God's got an ocean for you. Don't stay in the pool. Don't be superficial. Be deep. Seek the things of God. And God will bless you for it. Would you bow your head with me? I realize I preached 12 minutes too long, but you're okay. This is very important. I believe God sent a word here today to help you grow. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to know him. You cannot be saved without him. You can't be moral enough, rich enough, good enough, whatever you think you might get to heaven by. It takes Jesus, his shed blood what he did at the cross by his resurrection and him reigning in glory for you to believe in him. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't really, really know that you know Jesus, you will not get to heaven without him. If you need to give your heart to the Lord, right now I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand with mine and say, Pastor Mike, I want to make sure I make heaven. I don't want to be lost. I need Jesus Christ to get me there, and today I'm willing to do that. Secondly, maybe you have served the Lord, but you've kind of wandered away, and you're really not in the place that you should be. I'm not saying you're lost, but how many of you know everybody needs to belong somewhere? You need a place to grow, a place to connect to, a place to be taught, place to fellowship, a place to give your love, your gift to somebody else. 
So today, if you need to connect, if you need to find a place to call home, if you need to come home to the Lord, would, would you lift your hand? I know it takes some courage to do that. Would you just lift your hand with mine and say, Pastor, I need to connect. I, I need to be at the place where I need to be with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Now here's the last thing. I want you to listen very closely. How many of you would agree with me? And I'm going to include myself first. I could be deeper than I am. I need to avoid being superficial. And I need to continually to seek the vastness of what God has for me. And I'll be the first one right now to lift my hand. Say, Lord, help me not to be superficial. Help me to be supernatural. And let me be deeper than I've ever been in my life in my pursuit of you. Hands are going up all over this place. Stand with me right now. We have people that's going to help us pray. But I want you to look at me just for a minute. As they come, if you raise your hand, I want you to very quickly, very quickly come and stand right here with me. I'm the first one here because I had my hand up. If you raise your hand, I want you to very quickly come and just stand right here. Come on, let's give them a hand, church, as they come right now. I want you to come just stand right here. You're not joining the church. No, nobody's going to embarrass you. You're going to do anything. But I'm just going to ask you to stand right here. We're going to pray together. We're going to ask God to help us. We're going to ask God to make us deeper. I, I'm not interested in going through the same old thing over and over and over, but I want to be someone who is not superficial. I'm going to wait just for a moment. If there's anybody else, I certainly don't want to miss you right now. This may be a change this may be a pivotal point in your Christian walk right now that you're saying, I'm going to go deeper with God. Come on, people are still coming. Now let me ask you something. Would you be willing to just circle this group? I need about 50 people to come just circle this group right now. Come on, if you're, you're part of the church, come on, we're, we're the church. Let's just circle this group right here. We're going to pray together. We're going to ask God to help us. Pray for me. We're going to ask God to take us to deeper things, help us not to be superficial believers. Let us be real, genuine, authentic. Let us be good witnesses to our community. Let us not be poor witnesses, but good witnesses. Come on, all over this house, let's pray together. Father, right now, we're standing in your presence. We're asking you to lead us and guide us. God, make us who you want us to be. Forgive us of where we failed. Make us deeper. Help us to be accepting like you. Not that we accept sin or we want to accept some of the things our culture is trying to hand out to us, but we want to love people like we've never loved people before. Let us not have a Pharisee spirit, a critical spirit, a condemning spirit, for you did not come to condemn the world, but the world through you might be saved. So God, let us be embracing and loving and reaching. Father, that's our prayer. So for all of us today, let us love the Lord. Seek Him. Know that He has good things for us. If you're praying, continue to pray. For the rest of you, I want you to look at me just for one moment. You know me. I believe in a good confession. Raise up your right hand. If you're able, raise it up. Say this with me, Lord Jesus Christ, help me to be like you. I don't want to be shallow. I don't want to be superficial. I want to be spiritual. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. God bless you. I love you. See you Wednesday. I knew that would be an inspiring message that would encourage you and lift your spirits. That's what we try to do at Ray of Hope. Whenever we preach the word, we want to do it in a way that's encouraging. Now, we know we got to tell the truth, and we do that, though, with a heart full of love. We appreciate you guys, and we love you, and we're glad that you're a part of this, and we'll see you next time.